And this is where we're going next, to the dig. Dr. Rubenstein here, we're going into the Jarvik Center, which is, it talks about the Vikings in the area. So let's see what's going on here. I will. Okay. See where the archaeologists found the fences that neatly separated the properties from one another, forced them to walk and stick. Even then, a very tried and tested method of, of, of building a uh, structure. The buildings themselves were forced to wattle houses. You can see a wall here. Perhaps it, you think it's so thick because it has a raised earth in a bench just inside the wall there. Um, it has forced them to wattle, walk and stick uh, 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 fabric of the wall, but also larger beams that have supported a timber and thatch roof. And behind you you can see the fireplace in the back in the middle of the house there. And it's a, just a bare earth floor, a base of clay, and then Roman ceramic building materials, bricks and tiles placed around the uh, uh, the fire pit. Uh, another bench on the other side there. So the whole the whole one room building, one story is only about six or seven metres by three or four. Very, very small and compact. If somebody's packed a lot of buildings onto this street, uh, with garden spaces and windows as well. The rubbish bits in the garden tell us that people lived here. There were homes where people uh, uh, lived, but there were also some commercial industrial areas. People here uh, were, were working their crafts. They were blacksmiths, leather workers, wood turners. We think the name of the street, uh, Coppergate, originates from the Scandinavian name Kapari Gata. The street of the cup makers. So I think it's retained its original Viking Age here, but there's a street for that to be Is this a formation of some sort? So, <clears throat> so the post and wattle houses sort of burst into the archaeological record. The street appears in about, about 1900. By the mid 900s, we see this different type of building appear. So yes, these are the foundations uh, of buildings that we can date from, from, from the timbers that survived. That's the cellar wall of a house ah. from uh, the 950s. We can be very accurate about when, when that wood was cut down. Um, so the street was on a more sort of severe incline then. And what they started doing was cutting into that slope, and basically building cellars, so that part of the house was, was, was um, below ground. Um, that would give you 
either one very big sort of chamber, or it will give you a, 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 a bifurcated sort of uh, upstairs or downstairs, basically. A cellar, if you like. Um, so that's what it's like. They would be a lot more um, sanitary, a lot more robust, they last a lot longer. Uh, so it's sort of an indicator that you know, the street is becoming more <laughs> gentrified, I suppose. Okay. Uh, you'll see both types of um, uh, a house recreated on the ride. We recreated the street, we rebuilt the house where uh, they were stood, we populated them with, with animatronics doing all the things that we found out. Wow, so, that sounds okay. exciting. Okay, very well. Sometimes using chains of middlemen to carry goods from one side of the Viking world to the other. Silks and the cowrie shells found here suggest trade with Central Asia, the Eastern Mediterranean, and the Red Sea. It's possible that Arab traders, like this one, made their way to Europe to sell their goods. Slaves may have come to Europe from Dublin and elsewhere, bringing with them the spoils of their lands or packages. Slaves were an important part of society all over Northern and Western Europe at this time. It looks like this slave trader is trying to make his way to Copperhead. But before we get there, let's have a look at some of the many craftspeople working here in the city. Here's Sigurd. He's using animal bones and antler from deer to make some everyday objects such as cones, 
icon places skates and bone pillars. Making a comb from anchor would be very time consuming. The ones found here were made from many pieces riveted together and then decorated. We know that the Vikings like to keep themselves well groomed, as we found many combs in the excavations, as well as items such as tweezers and even ear screws. We now head away from the river towards the street, Copy, and meet some more of the people who lived and worked here. Ahead, you can see my building. These older houses were built from posts and wattles and have built <coughs> stones and thatched leaves. Most of these houses went out of use in the middle of the 10th century when they were replaced by the old plant buildings that we'll talk about later. These early houses were built end on to the streets and had long backyards with rubbish pits in them. It's not likely that they grew much food in the yards, but they probably kept animals there, such as those pigs you can see in the paint by the fence. From the many pig bones we found, we know that Viking pigs were quite short and had a long snout like a wild boar. Pigs will eat almost anything, so it would have been a great way to turn household waste into milk. Here's the blacksmith's house. Look inside and you can see his wife by the fire. Rumi, the blacksmith, is teaching his son how to sharpen a knife he just made. Like English smiths were masters of their craft, and here in Europe they made everything from relay handbags. Now we go across to the next property and visit his neighbour, Uni, in one of the new style wooden factories. Unic is making cups and bowls by turning wood such as oak, rash, and his pole made. You can see all the wooden pole ways down there because children make the things to spin it off. By the way, it's this train that we think from its name to copy. The street of the cup makers. Another building is being built behind the old house. Here, the cellar is being dug out and lined with old panels before the upper story is added. You can see the stack of turrets over there that are going to be used to roof this building. Looks like the buildings are having a rest. This family also a bit of the blend. The children have been taught to play another tackle by their grandfather. He found a wooden game and lots of pain pieces, made from bone, wood, and iron, so it must have been a popular pastime. Let's go back towards the river where big trading ships have been that have come up from the North Sea. Here, traders are unloading their goods alongside fishermen doing their cash. Goods and raw materials from the coast plain, as well as land and valuable items from further afield, were brought into Europe here. Iron armory parts from Britain alongside amber, sharpened stones, and raw recycled from Scandinavia, and good wine from the Rhineland. Jorvik was truly bustling, a vast international trading centre. Here's some fishermen cleaning their catch and mending their nets. Fish from the rivers in the sea were brought into Europe and we found thousands of fish bones that tell us exactly what the people had, which included lots of fish, eels, and even oysters. So these men are probably doing a long trade. Have a look at the man cutting the fish. His face has been reconstructed based on a skull that is found in Europe. Later on in the visit, you see more real faces like this. This next plot is a backyard where the people living here seem to have been dyeing their own cloth. The people of Yorbrook spun fleece, they dyed and wove their own wool to make textile from which they made their own clothes. Natural dye products such as madder, red, gold, and dyed blue were all used to create shades of red, yellow, blue, green, 
vibrantly coloured clothes were certainly brightened up the streets of Melbourne. On this plot of land, there was a gully, suggesting that a dyed bath had been tipped into it. Limestone lined that ditch running up to this massive way to the back door. cellar below where goods are stopping. Above the sunken room, the window openings are only small, so as you can see, it would have been quite dark inside these houses. In addition to the hearth, small pottery lamps and wax candles were used to create light so that the people who lived here could carry out their everyday tasks. <laughs> In this front room, we can see a woman working at the loom, which was used to weave woolen cloth for clothing and blankets. We're now moving into Coppergate itself, an important commercial street of Ditty and Roving. As you can see from these stories, you can buy almost anything. Copperhead is just one of the many streets in this city, which was home to more than 10,000 people. The streets of the city of York are covered in filth and mud, rutted by car wheels, potteries everywhere. This leather worker seems to be having a problem sewing his shoe pieces together. It looks like he has Viking's disease, a Ducreton's contraction. You can see it's caused the fingers on his hand to become clawed. It's a genetic disorder that runs in families, and seen particularly in middle-aged men. Tradition has it that it originated with the Vikings who spread it throughout Northern Europe and beyond as they travel and intermarry. This couple here are arguing about what to have for supper, meat or fish. It would seem that life hasn't changed too much over the last thousand years. They're arguing with Old Norse, but if you listen carefully, you can hear Old English, Middle Welsh, and Old Irish all being spoken in this street. Here's a food seller trying to sell this wealthy-looking woman a cabbage of some sort. It doesn't look like the type of thing that would tempt her or her young baby. This woman looks like she's struggling to cross the road. We only found two complete skeletons in the excavation here, and this woman is based on one of them. You can see that she's walking with a crutch due to her hip problems and arthritis. You can find out more about her in the galleries to come. Here, we're in another of the new buildings. The first Vikings who came here were not Christians and worshipped their pagan Norse gods, but they seem to have adopted Christianity quite quickly. There is lots of evidence for there being a Viking era church just behind Coppergate, and there were many other new churches built in Norway at this time. Here's a priest administering last rites. He would always have worn a stole around his neck, as seen here, as it marked his priestly status. We found a very small silk, pink coloured reliquary pouch in one of the buildings. The embroidered cross on it suggests that it once held holy relics which have since disappeared and are now a mystery. Each property is separated from the next by woven local fences. You know, from the five tons of animal bone found in the excavation, that 
people's diet was quite similar to ours, with lots of beef, pork and mutton, as well as poultry and fish. Supplying this food may have been one of the reasons for the major changes in the countryside we see around it at this time. In this backyard, animals have been slaughtered to provide meat and other resources. Body parts of cattle must have been a fairly familiar sound and smell around Viking Age Rock. As well as supplying meat, cattle calves have also provided corn and honey, both valuable resources for making everyday items. Stomach contents and powder were other byproducts of this sort. There must have been loads of flour, breeding and rubbish pits and dumps across the city. The red cash down on the fence would have been a regular visitor, scavenging the city, particularly in the backyard. Toilets were also been situated in the backyard. Pits in this year were clearly used as a tool, as they were full of human waste, as well as moss, which is a type of Viking Age toilet paper. This man here doesn't look too happy to be disturbed, so perhaps we'd better move on. Here, we are in our final house. In the excavations of Copper we found a few Viking Age musical instruments, including a set of pan pipes which can still be grown. Music, saga telling and poetry must have been important to the Viking world. Iceland and Scandinavia are cultures rich in stories, traditions that developed in Viking times. Norse mythology, which conjures up gods and monsters living in known realms, is still there. And we can picture what it was like sitting around a hour enjoying tall tales of magic and bravery. Right on the spot. As we arrive at the end More of the come. line of the Norfolk, remember that everything you have seen is based on the evidence dug up by archaeologists from York Archaeological Trust. You can see some of the 40,000 actual objects they found here in the displays ahead, and you can find out more by asking one of our team. If you want to learn more about the historic city of York, you can go to Tim and actually have a go at digging up some evidence of your own. Whatever you do, enjoy your visit with us here today, and come back soon, as we're all discovering more as we dig through York's fascinating past. Hi guys, welcome back. Do you enjoy it?
you know that the value of two things is the same in silver. Yeah. That's what two it. things is quite bother with the middle step. Yeah. fancy it, maybe he's saving for his old age, hopefully. That's eight chickens. And that's four chickens. Because it's smaller, less weight of silver, less pain. And it works the same way. You want to make more pain, you just pile more silver. Very good. Interesting. They also all get their own names as well. So Peninga, obviously, you know that one. Yeah. Still used today as a penny, so yeah. now it's made copper. Half a peninga, a hoof peninga, a half penny. And then, of course, a fifth peninga, a fourth piece, ends up known as a farthing. Yeah. 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 So, what's your name in English? Um, well, my name is Steger in Old Norse, which translates roughly to uh, stepper or wanderer. Oh, okay. Mm. But that's not your English name. Uh, my English name is Sam, which is also, ironically, within some of the sagas. However, I felt it would be very confusing for my lovely colleagues if I was Sam, what is known as Sam. <laughs> <laughs> or it might be easier, they'd just call me Sam either one. Oh, no problem. Can we get five of them? Right, I am just handing over to my lovely friend here. Yes. Who will be able to help you answer. Okay. Uh, the gentleman would like five. Five months, lovely. That's ten pounds, please. Yeah. Instead, they probably just had a young apprentice just sort of holding it as a blacksmith whacked down. <laughs> but don't get too many volunteers for that. It's health and safety hazard nowadays. Pull that over the top, and there will be a loud noise now as I strike your coin. We'll get the proper hammer out. We'll get a small one in there. <laughs> There we go. There's the first of your Viking coins, the Viking sword in the middle, the hammer of Thor, mule net underneath. Then the Anglo Saxon side with the Christian cross, the inscription of King Athelstan around the edge. I'll pop that in a wallet for you. And I'll make your next coin now. Okay, thank you. And again, another loud noise. There we go. Jump down here. <laughs> That'd be a tricky little thing sometimes. There's your second coin there. Okay. And yeah, as my colleague was saying, these would buy you 16 chickens or four barrels of beer or a small pig back in the bike. So, a lot of options of what you can spend that coin on. Well, I'm in luck. <laughs> there we 
Yeah, with five of these, you'll buy a lot, a lot of chickens. <laughs> and a couple of pigs. And a few pigs, yeah, yeah, that's it. Maybe some beer, maybe a little bit of beer. And oh, sure. Maybe with this many clothes, you might be able to buy a, a horse or something like that. <laughs> That'd be more expensive. It's quite a lot for a slave, though, so you're not quite, not quite the level where you can afford a slave. Uh huh. Is your fourth coin now? Yeah, fourth one there. Oh, yeah. Much the same as the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Now okay. this is your last coin now. Is it? All right. So yep. Yeah. Add another loud noise just around this off here. There we go. There is your final coin as well. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're a very, very rich Viking now. Yeah. So <laughs> you got a lot I of was that. rich beforehand. Right? <laughs> rich, my first name. Rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. That's too bad. Thank you. There we go, starting with this blank coin. And Viking signs have made out of silver. Sadly, for only two pounds today, it is made out of pewter. I'm not, not quite trusted to look up for this much silver, sadly. Place it on the first of our two coin steps. There's the other one. These are coins from my system there. I got two coins. Can you put them in my backpack? That's sort of waxed down. I quite like having all my coins. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. Now there will be a loud noise now. There we go, so there is your Viking's point. Viking's sword on the middle, and the hammer of Thor, we all know that any. We've got the Anglo-Saxon side, which is due to us, and it's going to be a good one. He's making it right now. Thank you very much. Cheers. I got five of them. Hello. Come on, buddy. Uh, no, I make it fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, one point, yeah. Yeah, Sally, we're not allowed to allow people to do it. So. <laughs> Health and safety has to die. Yeah, someone runs away with the axe. <laughs> Just one, is it? Thank you. 